first year after his awakening, the Buddha gave a Dharma talk called the Owada Padimukha. It was a summary of the main principles of the teaching. He was teaching 1,250 arahants. He was going to send them out to spread the teaching. And many of them had become arahants simply on hearing one Dharma talk. And so he wanted to make sure that they had a complete sense of what the training was all about. And there's one passage in the, in the summary that's called the heart of the Buddhist teachings. Never doing any evil, bringing skillfulness to completion, and purifying the mind. It basically sounds like, don't do anything bad, do what's good, clean up your mind. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It's just this, never doing any evil, all, all forms of evil, even the slightest ones. You want to avoid everything that you know is going to be harmful. And that requires you to be very meticulous, because there are a lot of things that we tend to let slip in our daily lives. Little white lies, sitting around fantasizing about things that excite lust, excite anger. We feel it's okay, nobody else knows, it's just our minds. Well, that stuff is not good, because it becomes a habit in the mind. So you have to be very scrupulous with yourself. Even more complex is this business of bringing skillfulness to completion. Because there are a lot of virtues in being a fully skillful person in mastering the path. And it is a path that you master. It's not something you can memorize and then just spout off. It's a skill that you have to work at and has many dimensions. And a lot of the virtues that you have to develop are ones that sometimes seem contrary. You want to have conviction, faith in the teachings, but also have to have a very critical mind. And those two qualities are not totally antithetical, but they tend not to go together. As Buddha says, he wants you to appreciate students who are easy to teach, who took instructions well, but also were inquisitive. Again, those are not mutually exclusive, but they tend not to go together. Most of us tend to come to the practice with skills that are kind of lopsided. We may be very smart, and then we have all of the bad habits that go with smart people. Or we may not be all that smart and have some good things that go with the knowing that you're not smart. But at the same time, there are the problem is when you can't figure things out and don't understand things. So we've got to learn how to take stock of where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. And then work on strengthening things all around. A lot of this has to do with a sense of having time and place. Like when you're meditating, there are times when you want the mind to be just really, really still and not engage in anything else except just being with the one topic of your meditation, and not even engaging that too much in the sense of being very active with it. You want to be able to settle down and spend some time just right there with the sensation of the breath. Don't analyze it too much, because if you analyze it too much, you lose it. But then there are other times when you do have to analyze things. Try to understand what's going on. And these, again, are not mutually exclusive talents, but they are talents that tend not to go together. You have to figure out which one has to be emphasized at which time. Like when the mind is still, how long do you keep it there? And there are no hard and fast rules. This comes under that list of teachings that Buddha has about the qualities of a person of integrity. There are seven altogether. Knowing the Dharma, that's a matter of learning what the, Dharma, <coughs> what the Dharma actually says, what the Buddha taught. Everything else, though, you have to learn by being around people who are skilled. Like knowing what it means, what they call the atta of the Dharma, the purpose and the meaning. The word atta has both, both meanings. And it's very easy to read the books. I mean, you can read scholarly books on Buddhism, and the person has read a lot but understands very little. There's a 
kind of a lopsidedness that comes from knowing too much without having any contact with people who have actually been putting these teachings into practice. The other qualities include having a sense of yourself, you know, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, having a sense of enough. How much food is enough? How much sleep is enough? How much meditation is enough? These are questions that can be answered in two or three seconds, or questions that you have to answer for yourself by observing. And be willing to be observed. This is what being trained is all about. You want to be with people who have more training than you have, so you can pick up things from them. A lot of things are subliminal. And sometimes they're the most important ones. I would say that a lot of my training with the John Fuang was during the times when he was sick. And it wasn't like he was giving Dharma talks while he was sick, but his way of handling the sickness was a Dharma talk in and of itself. And the way I was expected to behave around him. That's something I had to learn by trial and error. There was a lot of error. But eventually I learned this is how you look after someone. Show them respect. Let him be in charge of his illness. In other words, he was the one deciding how it was going to be treated. My problem as a Westerner is I had lots of what I thought was knowledge, but it wasn't useful at that particular time. So a lot of things you know you have to be willing to put aside and have to know when to put them aside. There were times when I'd have my opinions and he'd basically say, look, you're a Westerner, your opinions are not welcome here. And then I'd say, okay, we'll just do whatever I'm told. And then there'd be other times when he'd say, don't you ever think for yourself? He himself had the same treatment from a John Munn. There were times when he was sick. He'd ask for medicine, and a John Munn would say, look, we're out here in the forest. If you're ill, use the Dharma to treat the, the illness. There'd be other times when he'd be sick. He wouldn't ask for medicine, and John Munn would say, look, we have the medicine. Why don't you, why don't you take it? So it's not like he was being contrary, simply that he was teaching a sense of what's the right time and what's the virtue, what is the strength, what is the skillful quality that has to be developed right now. A lot of times you can't learn that just by observing yourself, but the more you can observe yourself and sort of look around, look at things from all sides, look at your behavior from all sides, things you seem to be doing really well, okay, ask yourself, okay, what's wrong with what I'm doing well? Maybe there's something more that can be developed to flesh out, fill out your skillfulness so it does become all around. This is a quality of kalanyuta, having a sense of the right time. There's having a sense of knowing what kind of people are worth associating with, how you judge other people as to whether they're going to be good examples or not. And then finally, knowing how you act in different situations with different groups of people. All of these things are things you have to learn by observing. But having that ability to look at the corner of your eye and ask yourself, okay, what I'm doing seems to be fine, but what's wrong with it? Where is there an imbalance in my skill? When you learn how to look all around like that, then that gives the possibility for the skill we're developing to be an all-around skill. After all, we've got eight factors in this normal path that we're trying to follow. They sometimes seem to be heading off in different directions. To get right view, you have to understand the teachings. Right concentration, you've got to get the mind really still. Right effort involves sometimes abandoning, sometimes developing. Sometimes doing what you can to stay as much as possible in the present moment. Other times it requires thinking about the future a little bit. In the sense of you know you're going to get into, you know, get into a difficult situation. Think it through beforehand. 
how can you avoid doing something that's going to be unskillful? So again, there's a time and place for all these different skills. You can't learn them by reading books. You can learn bits and pieces of the skills that way, but learning how to put them together. So the path does become a path in harmony. That requires lots of trial and error and using your powers of observation and being will, willing to look around. You may think that your feet are clean, but you walk in the, into a house and you look around, oh, you have footprints behind. How can you change that? In other words, you think you're doing something really well, but you turn and look, oh, there, there was some unexpected shortcomings to what I was doing. Always be willing to look for those. Having that attitude gets you through a lot of the difficulties that meditators tend to have. They tend to go off in one direction, take something to an extreme. And the Buddha himself, after having an extremely pleasant, sensual existence, went off in the other direction and had an extremely harsh six years of self-austerities, finally realized, okay, neither extreme was working. In each case, he was doing a one-fold path, pursuing pleasure, pursuing pain. He realized this middle way, it's not just halfway between pleasure and pain, but it's middle in the sense that you're trying to be good all around. And get your good qualities balanced. So this is what it means to develop skillfulness or bring skillfulness to completion. All the aspects of being skillful, being humble and being confident, being easy to instruct and thinking for yourself. It's learning how to put those things together that the real where the real skill lies.